Three, two, one, going live. Hello, everyone. Hello, this is Thersites the Historian. I'm here tonight with Sean Chick. We're doing the Sunday show two nights early. Happy Saturnalia to everyone out there. I know that's what most of you <laughs> celebrate, obviously. And um, <laughs> hopefully tonight finds you all well and good. Tonight's episode, the theme is Blood in the Snow. This is about battles which took place under winter conditions, hopefully with snow on the ground. And it's just kind of a random sampling. We're obviously not covering all of them. But we've each chosen just a few we'd like to talk about because we find them interesting for various reasons. I personally will be covering the battles of Fule and Munikia, which are kind of a pair. And for those of you not familiar with that, don't worry, you will be soon. Another battle I'll be looking at is the Battle of Octodurus, and I'll also be looking at the ba the second battle of Bidriacum in 69. So those will be my main three battles, or I guess four, really. And then what things do you plan to cover, Sean? Well, you know, talk a bit about Trenton, the Battle of New Orleans, and I'm very interested in the December 1862 um, Union offensives which culminated in the battles of Stones River, Fredericksburg, Chickasaw Bayou, and um, Prairie Grove. Okay. Yeah. So, no, that's my plan, at least. Um, but anyway, uh, start us off, sir. All right. Well, we're going to start off with the battles of Fule and Munikia. Now, these are not large-scale battles, yet they played a major role both in the history of Athens and, I would argue, in the history of Western civilization as it pertains to the history of democracy. Let me explain. In the late 404, or at least by late 404, Sparta had won the Peloponnesian War. Athens had been defeated, and the Spartans had imposed a new government upon the Athenians. The democratia, or as we call it, democracy, was out the window, and it had been replaced by the rule of men known as the Thirty. These were thirty of the wealthiest and most oligarchically inclined Athenians. Many of the men who had been leaders of the Demos during the war were in exile at this time, and the Thirty, their main priority was to keep order in the city. Even the very survival of Athens was something of a controversy, however, as Sparta's main allies, Corinth and Thebes, have wanted Athens eliminated, because Athens had been an annoyance to them and also as a major geopolitical rival, it had hindered their prosperity. So especially for Thebes, if Athens were to disappear, its trade would go through the roof. So both of them are already kind of pissed that the Spartans allowed the Athenians to survive the war. And because of that, when refugees from Athens start looking for fellow Democrats around the area to shelter them, there are plenty of takers. So there are already a good number of Democrats in exile. Now, this is intensified by the actions of the Thirty, who are emboldened by the presence of a Spartan garrison. Many of the men in the Thirty are greedy, and also these are men who are hardcore oligarchs. They have hated democracy their whole lives, and they are dedicated to literally killing off all of the people who believe in democracy. So that's what they start doing. They start going around accusing people of being sycophants or demagogues or whatever other charges they might throw at them. And by the way, a sycophant during this period was not a suck-up, but rather someone who was a false informer. And then a demagogue hmm. is someone who supposedly misled the people, although at this time the term meant simply leader of the people, so a popular leader. This could actually apply to anyone in theory. So those words have shifted meaning over time. But let's not get too deep into that. One of the key leaders of Athens who was still alive was a man named Thrasybulus. He had been a general. He probably had about 10 years of total experience under his belt in terms of being an elected general. He had been present at many major battles. In fact, a lot of the victories people tend to attribute to Alcibiades also featured Thrasybulus and another man named Thrasylus in command as co-commanders. And it's worth noting that while... Thrasybulus would win battles with that Alcibiades, the opposite was not true. So there's a good case to be made that Thrasybulus was actually the guy who won the battles that Alcibiades gets credit for. So this is a hmm. capable man, and he is a dedicated Democrat. 
That does not mean that he was any less elite or rich than the men who were men of the 30, however. The leader of the 30 was a man named Critias, who was the uncle of the philosopher Plato. And Critias was the most oligarchical of all the oligarchs. Unlike his nephew, he gave no fucks about virtue or anything like it. He just wanted to find his opponents, kill them, and take their money. Um, he broke yeah. no opposition. There was a guy in the government named Theramenes who was kind of a moderate oligarch. He didn't want any bloodshed. He just wanted to keep the peace and have Athens recover under what he saw as a moderate system with 3,000 people being in charge, 3,000 hoplites. But they started butting heads, Critias and Theramenes, and Critias was winning, and um, people were being more and more oppressed. Lots of people were fleeing. Other people were being murdered. The... The uh, philosopher Socrates was actually employed to try to do headhunting at one point. He refused, supposedly, but he was in league with all these guys. He was good friends with Critias and later, of course, Plato. And by the way, just in case we think Plato was completely innocent, Plato was already in his late 20s by this time. So while he was not quite a political age, he was pretty damn close. And it would be trying to make up for his uncle's crimes that he would get so obsessed with issues of virtue and ethics for the rest of his life. At least that's my belief. And also why he thought huh. he could never get involved in politics. Because if he were to run for office, people would be like, hey, isn't your uncle Critias literally the biggest murderer in our entire history? I mean, Critias was Critias literally, to later generations of Athenians, was their Hitler. He, he was, Damn. Yeah, and also, later on, the actions of Critias in the 30 will completely discredit the idea of oligarchy in Athens as a political possibility. So anyhow, uh, the 30 are doing some pretty despicable things that aren't necessary because they're already in power and they got the backing of Sparta. So Thrasybulus is in Thebes and as soon as he hears that Theramenes has been murdered he decides the time has come to strike because now there's no chance of a peaceful resolution and if he waits any longer then the 30 will eliminate all of the Democrats or potential allies that they might have. So Thrasybulus gathers 70 mostly Athenian exiles and marches boldly to a fort on the Attic frontier called Phule. This is basically just a mountain not far from the border of Boeotia, which is the home territory of Thebes. It's to the northwest of Athens, and the idea is that if he holds up at this place, men will join him, rather than going into exile. Some accounts suggest that his force is pretty ragtag, that they might not have even been fully armed. Well, Thrasybulus and his 70 men attract some attention from the 30, and they march out to try to squelch this early. They march out with the 3,000 men who are hoplites, and we don't know exactly their orientation. They seem to have been fairly conservative, but not necessarily into the bloodshed, so their morale's questionable, but there's 3,000 of them. And then you also have the cavalry, sort of the richest, probably 1,200 or so Athenians. So you've got a pretty large force versus three, 70 men on a hill. And the problem is that the, the young men who are oligarchs who are super into the cause get overzealous and try to attack the fort. Some of them get killed or wounded. And things are looking bad, though, because the 30 are just going to block off this fort and then starve out Thrasybulus. Problem solved. Then a big snowstorm blows up. And the 30 kind of panic because snowstorms are not common even in the winter in Greece. At least not uh, too common. So mm. they kind of panicked. They might have seen this as a sign from the gods, or otherwise it was just a huge pain in the ass logistically. So they actually just fall back to Athens. They just give up. So that was actually the first battle at Phule. It's just a little bit of skirmishing, then it started snowing, and the 30 said, you know what, fuck it. Went home. But they knew that if they didn't do something about the men at Thule, that they would just start raiding the countryside. So they posted some guards who Xenophon says are were the, uh, men from the Spartan garrison. So there are some guards not far from Thule in case Thrasybulus wanted to march out. Because again, if you try to assault a hill fortress, it's going to be bloody. So what Thrasybulus does is he waits until his, his uh, following swells up about 700 men. And then he marched out and surprise attacked this force, also near Foule. He attacked them at night, or right at dawn at least, as they're changing shifts for the morning. And he completely routed this force, inflicted over 100 casualties, killed two men in their sleep, 
and also killed three of the cavalrymen. So three guys failed to get to their horse high. OBS is disconnected. Okay, it's reconnected now. All right. Uh, okay. I don't know if we missed anything because my OBS just cut off randomly. Uh, what's I'm sorry. What's what's OBS exactly? OBS is my streaming software. Ah, uh, okay, okay. But I think we're back. It should be fine. I don't think it cut off anything important. Uh, sorry about that, guys. It's just OBS being OBS. Actually, it never really fucks us. It's, it's pretty rare. So, anyway, uh, the 30 back at Athens panic. And they know that they might lose this war, despite the support of Sparta and everything else. So what they do is they actually go to the small town of Eleusis, which is a major religious sanctuary where they have the Eleusinian Mysteries. They pretend that they're doing a review to make sure that the garrison is in shape for a potential democratic attack. And when they round up all the men, they have them bound and murdered. And then they move in a lot of their own followers into the town. So this is now their backup position for their oligarchy. So they literally butchered a town of fellow Athenians, a town where most of the people make their living helping religious uh, visitors, people who are there to be suppliants or to become... Mm -hmm. Uh, part of the cult of Eleusis, and murdered them. So this is probably the most famous crime of the 30. And this is due to panic over Thrasybulus. Now Thrasybulus, for his part, has the initiative. So he takes mm. a thousand of the men he has, because now his ranks are really swelling, and he marches by night to Piraeus, which is the main port of Athens, and also the main place where there are democratic supporters. And initially... His plan was to get inside of the walls and fight as the men of the 30 come south. But eventually he realized that the 3,000 are too numerous to fight head-on, so instead he retreats to Munikia Hill, which is nearby. So here he draws up on a steep slope, and the men of the 30 are now determined to crush him once and for all. They also have some of the Spartans with them, and they realize that if they don't crush him soon that this whole democracy thing might be making a comeback. So they're willing to attack uphill. They have a big numerical advantage, 5 to 1 on all likelihood. Xenophon says that uh, the oligarchs put their men 50 deep, whereas the Democrats were only 10 deep. However, the Democrats are on a very steep slope, and they also have missile troops behind them. And a lot of the locals who live in the area who don't have weapons, presumably some of them slaves or even women, have just shown up, and now they're throwing rocks and ice balls and other things behind uh, Thrasybulus's men on top of the uh, men trying to come up the hill. Um, Thrasybulus tells his men, we got the position, and right is on our side, we're going to gain our vengeance. Then his seer comes up to him and says, Thrasybulus, before you launch any counterattack, wait until one of our men dies. One of our men will die or be badly wounded inside of everyone else, and that will be our sign from the gods that victory is at hand. And I mm. think we're going to win today, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. And what happened was he ended up being the first man to die, the seer. And then Thrasybulus knew that this was how things were going to go. So he ordered his men to strike and they completely routed and inflicted heavy losses on the oligarchs. And a lot of important people died in this battle, including Critias himself and another member of the 30, Hippomachus. There's also a man who was appointed to be one of the ten rulers of Piraeus who died in the battle, Charmides, who I believe is a character in one of Plato's dialogues, and about 70 mm. other people. And then after this, uh, the oligarchy was collapsing. Uh, the men were beginning to fraternize and uh, be like, hey, you're my neighbor. How's it been going since you've been in exile? Yeah, you know, farm still looks the same. So just to fast forward <laughs> past, past this battle... Um, this is when Sparta decided to officially intervene, because now it looks like Athens is going to go back to democracy. Back in Athens itself, right. the 30 are voted out of power by the 3,000. Uh, they call in Spartan assistance. The general Lysander arrives, and he turns the tables. So now Thrasybulus' men are in danger of starvation. But then, the king of Sparta, or one of the kings, Pausanias, arrives, and he decides that Lysander has overreached himself, that he has gone too far, and that he has really tried to make too many decisions without the approval of the government back in Sparta. So even though Pausanias actually defeats Thrasybulus in a battle, 
he ultimately decides that Athens and Piraeus and most of Attica will get Democritia once again. And there will be an amnesty where all previous crimes are forgiven, and then the men who want to stay with the oligarchy can go to Eleusis and live there. So this leads to an awkward period of Athenian democracy where Attica is not fully unified for a few years, and also because they all took the oath to not go after the oligarchs and get revenge, there is a lot of unease and social unrest in Athens, and every time there's a trial of somebody who's trying to make a case for someone's character, at least down to about 380, the question is always, where did you stand during the Civil War? Were you with the 30 or were you with the Demos? And oddly enough, even though Thrasybulus is one is clearly one of the great heroes of Athenian history, um, he actually does not feature that prominently in the sources. And I think it's because he was more of a hero to the people than he was to members of his own class who wrote the histories. That, and he does not appear to have been super charismatic. Okay. Um, so actually, if anything, if I always think of, if somebody had to ask me who was the ancient Bernie Sanders, I'd go with Thrasybulus. <laughs> um, also, Thrasybulus famously dies during either a night attack or a mutiny in 389. So he was Athens' main general in the north after this. He had a lot of connections up in Thrace and some other things. Um, yeah, Thrasybulus is one of my favorite historical figures, and I think he is one of the most underrated people. Um, but he was never fully politically dominant, even despite pulling this off, just because he had a prickly streak, and he tended to piss off a few people here and there. But anyway, yeah, I see. that's what I have for you for a nice winter battle out of Athens. And also, once the democracy was restored in 403, it would go on to last until 322, and then it would be revived again after that, but by that point it was kind of meaningless, so who cares? But without this, without these two battles, democracy would have ended in 404. So okay. this is democracy in another 80 years. I would say very important sequence of events, and it also, of course, depends heavily on Spartan problems. So that's all I got for that. I'll switch it over to that's you. That's all you got for that. Yeah, man. Well, um, for me, I think for the uh, for this one I'll talk about, in brief, the Battle of Trenton in 1776. Now, this comes during the American Revolution, and New York City has been captured by the British. George Washington has lost all the battles. The biggest one being, of course, Long Island. And he was chased across New Jersey by Charles Cornwallis. He gets across the Delaware River, and by that time, it's winter's coming, and the British stop. Understandably so, too. I don't think the British were dummies for stopping. I mean, it was cold. Washington was obviously, you know, obviously fucking beat. So they just said, all right, we're going to take a pause here. And the British set up a series of outposts across New Jersey. One of which is a large Hessian outpost at Trenton. George Washington is desperate. His army which at Long Island, when the, or at least when the New York campaign started, his army numbered over 20,000 men, has now been reduced to maybe like 4,000 men. And most of his losses are by desertion. In desperation, he decides that he will attack Trenton and attack it on Christmas Day. Johann Rall, the Hessian commander at Trenton, knows the Americans are coming. He doesn't know when, though. And Christmas Eve, there was actually a small attack on the Hessian camp by some militia. Rawl confused that and thought, oh, that was the main American attack, because he's like, okay, whatever. And, um, you know, it would be wrong to say the Hessians were drunk, but the officers definitely drank, because it's Christmas Eve into Christmas Day, right? Sure. Well, then... Washington crosses the Delaware, and his forces attack the Hessians at Trenton. One of them, sorry, 
the American casualties at Trenton are like three guys, maybe. One of which is the future president, James Monroe, who overran the Hessian outpost. Oh, I didn't know This Monroe victory... Got Wait, what'd you say? I didn't know Monroe got wounded know. in this battle. Yeah, yeah, he got, uh, he, he was, um, James Monroe was a young officer in the uh, Revolutionary War, and he was wounded at Trenton, storming the Hessian outpost. The Hessians are attacked and defeated in dramatic fashion. I mean, I mean, like, once again, American casualties are like three or four guys, and we, you know, cause over 100 killed and wounded and capture roughly 1,000 men. Um, this campaign will keep the American cause going when for many people it is arguably at its very lowest point now I will not say whether or not what, what's the lowest I mean what's the lowest point is it that or is it when Charleston surrendered don't want to debate between that but I will say that this is a very low point in the American revolution and George Washington, while he definitely had his flaws as a general, tactically at least, Trenton is probably his masterpiece. An attack made on Christmas Day in desperation and a stunning success too. And exactly what the Americans need to keep their morale up, to keep their will up. So... That, to me, also signifies something about winter battles. Most armies don't fight in winter. But occasionally, uh, an army or a side that feels itself at a disadvantage will attack at winter because of surprise. And it's what people do when they're on the ropes. And, you know? So, Trenton... Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that fighting over winter is very much a part of modern warfare, but not anything before that. Yeah, you do you do run into it a bit. I mean, not as much in musket combat. Usually armies took a rest anyway. You do run into it a decent amount in the Civil War, at least, you know, depending on how the winter weather was. Like, the winter of 60, 62 to 63 was relatively mild, so you run into it. But yeah, you get into modern warfare, they do it much more, that is for sure. Um, we'll talk about the Battle of the Bulge in a bit, probably. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah. Trenton, pretty important, I think, to keeping the American army in the field. Yeah, keeping the morale up. And also, it was fought a few days before the enlistments were up. Washington's idea was that if we win a victory now, we can increase those enlist enlistments or at least again retain more of our men. He was mostly correct. They had a decent number of re-enlistments after that battle. That's what they needed, though. Yeah. It could be debated, though, that let's say Washington attacks at Trenton and Rawl is actually ready for him to receive him and defeats him. Maybe the cause is over then. Could be. But, yeah, but this this last desperate attack made, I don't know, it's, I don't know if I'd call it a Hail Mary play necessarily, but um, it's, it's, um, it's one of those successes done in the midst of defeat. And that makes it all the more dramatic. And it is definitely George Washington's finest moment as a military commander. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. Okay. Mm. The decision to cross the yeah. Delaware is also probably his boldest strategic stroke. Yeah, probably so. Actually, yeah, I would say definitely so. Uh, but once again, a scheme hatched in desperation. Yeah. You know? Oh, I uh, forgot to mention oh, yeah. another mention interesting thing about Thrust of Bullis. Uh, mm -hmm. You know the famous Battle of Arganusi where there were two Triarchs tasked with rounding up the people who had been knocked off the ships? He was one of those two Triarchs at that battle. So uh, if you look closely oh, okay. in Xenophon's Hellenica, he actually features pretty prominently. So, because I know. 
I would say probably the most important Athenian you've never heard of, if I had to just pick one person. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so yeah, but also a similar deal with what you're talking about which, at Trenton, where winter warfare was extremely uncommon in Greece, despite the fact that Greek winters usually aren't a big deal. Um, armies were not terribly... Um, eager to go to war during the winter. They thought it was their right to only have to campaign in the summer. Winters, a lot of times when they would be repairing their equipment on their farms or what have you. So It makes a lot of sense, though, of course. You know, yeah. I mean, a big, a big, nice rest period between campaigns, of course. I sometimes feel that was the case with armies, is that they could have attacked in winter, but this is a mutual idea of like, eh, you know, we need, we need a break. You know? Yes, I think there, I think that was very much a part of it, and I think that's part of why Thrasybulus chose to strike when he did. And apparently, he psychologically had the measure of his enemies, because even though they had opportunities to crush his small force, they were easily deterred by bad weather. Hmm, interesting. Although, I mean, Thrasybulus told his men when they were at Munichia, "Yeah, back at Fule, the gods showed their favor to us by sending the snowstorm." So maybe the 30 also thought the snowstorm was a bad sign from the gods, and that's why they backed off. Mm. But also that the whole weather thing, it kind of reminds me of... Remember that one big strategic Civil War game we played that one time where uh, if you both roll the same thing, the turn just keeps going and going, and it always favors the north because they have more ground they have to gain? Yes, yes, so it's like I know the game. like a favorable weather... Uh, <laughs> because yeah, I mean, if you're the side with more resources, you want the weather to be as favorable as possible. You can keep pounding away. If you're the side at the disadvantage, you definitely want shit weather, so that way it's hard to advance. You know, you want torrential rains, snow, ice, the full enchilada when it comes to terrible weather. You want all of it. No, especially if you're a disadvantage too. You know. Um... In the Civil War, you can, uh, I mean, the winter of uh, 63 to 64 was a very harsh winter. And uh, there were no major offensives made by either side, really. I mean, except for like a few moves in the Deep South. But even then, not that much, really. You know, yeah. um, so. But, you know, the um, the winter of 62 to 63 wasn't so bad, and the Union was desperate for a victory that could make the Emancipation Proclamation look good. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. But, yeah, man, no, so... Um, but, yeah. Anyway, what you, what you got next, sir? The next battle I would like to bring to everyone's attention is a battle which took place during Caesar's Gallic Wars. It's called the Battle of Octodurus. There oh, do not wow. seem to be any real maps involved with it. It took place technically within the confines of what is now Switzerland, but what at the time was largely part of Transalpine Gaul. This was during the winter of 57 to 56. You can read a little bit about it here, although this is not a very detailed account. Caesar was not present for the battle, but he did send one of his legates, a man named Servius Sulpicius Galba. I'm not sure if he's related to the later emperor or not. Let's find out. Um, doesn't say, but I assume they're related just because their name is the same. Anyhow, his legate, Galba, was ordered to march into a valley in the extreme southeast of Transalpine Gaul, and the reason is because three local tribes had been harassing merchants traveling through and charging them a fee to pass through. To be fair, these tribes had never been officially mm. subdued by Rome, so from their perspective, they were just charging a fee to merchants passing through their sovereign territory. They did not think of themselves as being bandits or acting illegally. However, Caesar was Roman, so everyone who was not Roman was basically a criminal. So he sent Galba to deal with them. <laughs> and the Sorry. three tribes were the Nantuatis, the Viragri, and the Seduni. 
And Galba only had one legion with him, the 12th Legion, and then he had some native Gallic cavalry as well. His orders were to clear the district and also to winter in the area in order to subdue the locals. His strategy, he entered into a fairly narrow valley with some high cliffs on either side. He took two of his cohorts to hold off the Nantuatis and then took his other eight and positioned them in front of the primary village of the Viragri called Octodurus. This is in a sheltered valley and you have the high sheer cliff faces. You also have a river nearby, so there's water. And basically, he just Mm -hmm. set up a blockade of these people in a valley. He took some hostages, because without his permission, it was hard for him to get food and water. And he thought that he'd be able to winter there in peace. But then, all of a sudden, one morning, he woke up, and the two tribes had taken positions on the cliff faces nearby, and they were in a great position to charge down on this camp. So, they apparently held their position all day, he held a war council, and everyone agreed that the wise course of action would be to fight their way out and retreat from the area. But before they could do that, the two tribes of the Viragri and the Seduni attacked. So this led to a six-hour battle. And Caesar says that his men fought extremely skillfully, but of course they were woefully outnumbered. Supposedly it was 30,000 against maybe five or 6,000. And um, they were defending their camp, which is always a good thing for the Romans because technically they never lost while defending one of their camps because they were very well designed and they were well drilled in defending them. But the position was on the verge of collapse. And had this happened, and Caesar would have lost a legion very early on in the campaign. It would have been a setback for sure. But what ends up happening is that uh, Galba has two of his subordinates come up to him. One is the senior centurion, Publius Sextius Bachelus, and another one is a man named Gaius Volusinus. And their plan is to boldly counterattack out of all four gates all at once to shock the enemy. And Galba, who has no better idea, agrees to it. Now, keep in mind the Romans are completely exhausted, but they feel that the shock of charging out of the gates might just scare off the enemy. That's their sort of ace-in-the-hole, last-ditch effort. They will either win gloriously or die horribly. So they do it, and it ends up working. The Gauls completely panic. They break. And because of the narrow confines of this valley, it turns into a slaughter of the Gauls because they're trapped with nowhere to go. And of that 30,000-man force, 10,000 are slain. However... The day after this battle, Galba and his subordinates decide that their original plan to get the hell out of there was the right idea, so they burn their camp and they march back to friendlier territory. Huh. Yeah, so this is one of the more close-run battles of uh, Caesar's Gallic War, and there are a lot of them. There was a lot of battles. I remember the uh, one with the Nervi tribe. Was it Battle of Sabus? That was pretty. That was pretty close run too. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of battles that were waged, which were um, pretty closely fought, and this was one of them for sure. Hmm. Oh man. So it was a uh, pretty hard fought, pretty nasty. But they did survive. Mm. Yeah, um, there's been some slowdown in the... Uh, in What's YouTube going on? Too. I don't know. It, it says that it's not getting enough video to maintain smooth streaming. So I'm not sure how well what anybody can actually hear us. Do what? What the hell is smooth streaming? I don't know. <laughs> Ah, fuck, I don't know, man. Um, I'm just glad to be here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I think uh, it will be fine in the end, at least on the replay. But during this actual stream itself, it's not going super smooth. I don't, maybe everybody's streaming right now. Maybe that's the problem. Everybody's still. Yeah, it could idea. be a problem. What's your, uh, hey, um, what's your opinion, real quick, of uh, Caesar as a military commander? Um, overrated, underrated? What do you think? 
I actually think he's rated about right. And I think the general assessment of him is also pretty much spot on that he combines a great deal of competence with energy and some strategic insight, but mostly he's an he's more of a tactician than a strategist. But he's a very, very good tactician. Yeah. And there are some times where he makes bad decisions on a grand scale but manages to tactic his way out of them. Hmm. Uh, the, the ultimate example, of course, he has him trapped twice in Greece, and then he manages to fight and win at Pharsalus. Or, I mean, even Alicia. Alicia was a pretty close-run thing, too. I gotta say, man, you um, you essentially cut out there, man. Oh, really? Yeah, but it wasn't those cutouts where it was, it was like you were talking, it was like, he was g- 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 you know, like that. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Um, yeah, man. All right. We'll just keep persevering on. Uh, so you think the overall assessment of Caesar is accurate, that he was a very good general, a great general? Yeah, very he good. He made strategic but mistakes, good. but he could tactician his way out of it because he's a hell of a tactician. Yeah, and I mean, there's a fair amount of luck involved, too. Uh, I actually think the people who say that he got lucky aren't exactly wrong. But to go along with that, I mean, he put a lot of energy into it. He had a lot of charisma. His men were most excellent. They were very loyal. And they were willing to fight in conditions that most men maybe would not have just because Caesar had brought them victory in the past. That's why they were going without rations in Greece before the Battle of Pharsalus. A lot of men would have just surrendered at that point. But Caesar's men knew that he might still find a way. And he did. Yes, Especially yes. because of Scipio Metellus being incredibly stupid. And convincing Poppy to partake in his stupidity. Of course, it helped. And yeah, of course, Caesar had that um, had that battlefield charisma too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I mean, he dramatically he... would uh, have his horse led away, and even though he was by this time in his fifties, I mean, he was still fighting the front lines, and the men believed in him, and they knew that he wouldn't do anything. He wouldn't ask them to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. Yeah, no, battlefield charisma cannot be underrated. Um, I'm sorry, cannot be overrated, sorry. Uh, your ability to rally your men and to inspire them to great deeds. Uh, Caesar, Alexander the Great, yeah, it counts for quite a bit. And if, you're, you're right, man, I mean, he's got these men, they, they, they have a bad supply situation, but they have faith in that Caesar will find a way. Yeah, just like in uh, Star Trek Enterprise, they have faith of the heart. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've never seen Star Trek Enterprise. What the fuck does this mean? you know about the terrible mean? ballad intro, right? Uh, yeah, the intro's crappy. Well, the intro's uh, I've crappy. Heard, I've heard the intro before. What makes it worse is that on Netflix, when you watch it, you cannot skip that intro. You can skip every other intro for every other show on Netflix, but not that one. Why? I don't know, but you can't. There's no option well, that's unless you just fast forward. Well, that's fucking interesting, okay? <laughs> so I, when I watched through it, uh, I don't know, a couple years ago, I had to watch that shit every single time. Jesus, it's just a terrible fucking intro too, man. Yeah, it's the worst like, intro in Star Trek history by a mile. By a mile, man. It, but what the fuck kind of music is it, though? Because most ballad. of your t- Star Trek intros for TV shows, Shows is very like orchestral and powerful, and then you're listening to that one. It's like what shitty country music or something. It's not quite even country. I don't even know if it has quite a genre. It's just kind of. I've got faith. I've got faith. Faith of the heart. And it's just awful, <laughs> and uh, then it's just a, like a little slideshow of people's early space exploration. You know, so you just have a, a picture of an astronaut laughing. It might be Neil Armstrong or whoever. I think you got like a chimp in a space suit or I don't know what the fuck it is, but um, it's just, it's just kind of like supposed to be helpful Yuri Gagarin, about our right? future. Do what? I said Yuri Gagarin, right? Yeah, I think there's Yuri Gagarin and just, you know, the whole, all the famous astronauts of yore just to inspire us to look to the future where everything's going to be great. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to take our place among the great peoples of the of the galaxy. So, 
Uh, for my next winter battle, I believe I would like to talk about the Battle of the Bulge, the Arden Offensive. How much do you know about the Arden Offensive? Um, some stuff. I mean, I know that this was basically the a pet project of Hitler. And that yeah. he chose the two generals by hand, okay. Dietrich and um, von Monteufel. I also know that uh, you know the two field marshals above them had very little to do with it, Modell and um, von Rundstedt. And that yes, yes. They're also I don't know if there's really anybody with the authority to force the two army generals to actually cooperate. It seems like uh, Dietrich and von Manteuffel could basically do what they wanted. They were in some ways fighting very separate battles, that is true. Now, Modell was, of course, their direct supervisor, but he was not much involved. Um, although he seems, to be, he seems to have been more involved with Manteuffel with the 5th Ar Panzer Army, as opposed to the 6th Panzer Army, which is Dietrich. <laughs> anyway... One thing that's interesting to me about that, though, is the degree to which the Allies are surprised when it happens. Completely surprised. Hmm. Some of that was because the Allies had become too used to reading the, um, sorry, to reading the codes from the Enigma machine. You know, to knowing what the Germans are up to because they've decoded their stuff. Well, the thing is, before the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans are relaying messages to each other by word of mouth more often, by telephone. And also, Hitler suspected that the Enigma machine had been cracked anyway. So, of course, he's, he's informing his commanders about everything by word of mouth. Uh, the German soldiers involved were not even told they were attacking in some cases till maybe a day or two before. Which... The, the Actually, the German units that were set up in the Ardennes didn't even make too many probes before the battle, which has, a, which has an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is surprise. The disadvantage is knowledge of terrain and the units ahead of you is not quite so good. So the Germans, they're launching a massive offensive, and they're somewhat doing it in the dark in that regard. That said, very powerful offensive. Uh, what did Omar Bradley say about it? Oh, yeah, uh, Omar Bradley, this is a great line. He said, where did this son of a bitch get so much strength? Well, they transferred and... it from the east. <laughs> 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 well, it was funny, though, because you know, post-Normandy, there was a view amongst the Allies that maybe the Germans were about to completely collapse like they had done in 1918, but it didn't happen. For a variety of reasons, but whatever, it didn't happen. So, the attack is launched, but, of course, one of the problems with the Ardennes Offensive is that what made... Um, what ma the Ardennes Offensive is in part based on what the Germans did in 1940, attacking the Ardennes to take out the French and British armies. But one of the things that made that offensive work was that the French and British were convinced the main German thrust was north of the Ardennes. So it wasn't like the Germans were only attacking the Ardennes, they were attacking everywhere in 1940. But in 1944, they're attacking only through the Ardennes. Well, that it's kind of it's got it's a lot easier to zero in on where what's going on at that point. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Germans attack they have some success, of course, but they've got problems. The roads are fucking awful. They actually don't have enough gas to get to Antwerp. They have to steal gas, essentially. Okay, not the best idea, guys. <laughs> but it's like Ron von Rundstedt said, this offensive doesn't have a leg to stand on. Nevertheless, the Germans chew up numerous American units, surround some other ones, the offensive starts to bog down as the Americans and the British, the British units too, are thrown into the battle to halt the various prongs of the offensive. And this is one of the reasons, this also goes back to one of those reasons why you don't launch attacks in winter. The logistics of winter are just very hard. You know? 
like in the uh, like if you're in Napoleon's day, you can't live off the land. Well, in the case of the Germans, you'll have like it's cold, it's snowy, and then it the the snow melts, and now your roads are a fucking mud pile. Yeah. So the logistics of keeping up a winter offensive are not that easy. And it's going to be even harder for a country like Germany at that point in the war. Absolutely. But nevertheless, must be made clear, this is a very, very bitter fighting. But in the end, Baston is relieved, the flanks cave in, and the attack fails. A great case can be made the Germans should have lost more if the Americans had been a bit more aggressive in their attacks, and more creative probably too. But... Th- you know, um, at any rate, the bulge is reduced. And if you read German accounts from back then, one of the things they will mention is that the defeat of the bulge for them was like the last straw. Like once the battle of the bulge was over, they're like, okay, we've lost. So that's something I've read in a few German accounts. Where they said the defeat of the bulge was kind of, I would say like last straw, but it was kind of like they were like, when it happened, they got excited for a bit because, like, oh, we're attacking the Allies again. We've broken through. But once it fails, the feeling is, okay, there's no way we, we, there's no way we can win now. You know? Yeah. Anyway, got any thoughts on the Battle of the Bulge? Hell, ever seen the movie? Yeah, I've 1962. Seen that movie where they have the Germans who are English speakers trying to infiltrate the lines, and then some famous actor, yeah. John Wayne or whoever, has a machine gun in the back of a truck and guns down a bunch of Germans. And <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. So yeah, Telly Savalas is in there. He's um, he's got a tank that gets busted up, and he's like, "I've still got a machine gun," you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like um, the Battle of the Bulge was probably. A wasted opportunity. They had enough force to make a good strike, but not enough to follow it up, and they didn't really coordinate it or set up a clear command structure. They should have given Modal overall command of some kind, or at least uh, enough uh, control over both armies to uh, decide where reserves are committed, rather than making them both equal and then giving Dietrich uh, command of the reserve, so he got to send mm. what he wanted to von Manteuffel or keep what he wanted and then he his understanding was that Hitler wanted him to be the man to do it so he didn't give von Manteuffel the support that he could have um that was botched in that way and on yeah, the American yeah, preferred side Dietrich. Um, Dietrich the fucking alcoholic you know <laughs> well yeah Dietrich who was in his you know effectively his first ever army command and wasn't quite ready for the job he was not ready for the job. He also got totally blitzed a few days after the offensive started. Although there's a decent amount of evidence to show that Dietrich kind of was like, ah, oh, this war is going to be over anyway, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, he was right. I think another problem the Germans had in the Ardennes, though, is that the, one of the problems the Germans had in the Battle of the Bulge was that in 1940, the French were kind of right. The Ardennes is horrible tank country, you know? It's just it's 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 some dense woods and narrow roads, and when the Germans launch the Battle of the Bulge, there are enough Americans there to roadblock stuff, and that's all that counts. Yeah, you know. So, in that regard, the French in 1940 were kind of right. The Ardennes is a shitty place to attack through. Where the French were wrong is they didn't have they didn't have enough men there to do much defending. If they had, who knows what would have happened. Or, I mean, uh, what about that army they had defending uh, was the Meuse Crossing, where they had, uh, was his name, Karop there, uh, with all the like old fat reservists, and they're up against the Panzer troops in 1940. Oh, yeah, that's the Battle of Sedan. Yeah, so you got yeah. uh, basically all the top generals and units in the German army versus Frenchmen who are basically all over 40 and have second-rate equipment. Sounds like a great fight to me. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how it's going to go. I can't, can't predict that. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, 
so what do you how do you feel about the people who or not the people themselves but the argument that had the Germans had say 50 more half tracks at the bulge that the battle might have turned out differently no Jesus Christ out no. they didn't have a gasket to Antwerp anyway you know yeah I mean that's kind of how I, mean, I feel they, about it I mean I think even if Bastogne yeah. had fallen that eventually the bulge would have failed because they just did not have the logistics or the manpower to really strike a knockout blow. Yeah, also I mentioned the diversionary power as well. I mean, one of the reasons the Germans did so well in 1940 is they were launching a full-blooded offensive north of the Ardennes that drew in the British and the French. In 1944, there is no other offensive. So when the bulge is launched, the Allies never go, it's a diversion. They're like, okay, that's the main German thrust. Go crush it. There's no confusion about it, you know? Yeah, and also, uh, as we did, as we learned in our uh, second sort of like World War II general roundup, the British and French did not really do a hell of a lot of coordination. Uh, the French had not very much interest in coordinating with Gork, even though he was ready and eager to serve. So they mm -hmm. really didn't come up with much of a strategy. And so once shit started going south, they just kind of fell apart. Yeah. No. Poor coordination between those two countries, for sure. And um, okay. in 1944, yeah, the Germans were pretty much spent. Also, as soon as the air got clear enough for air power, that battle was turned into a massacre. All those panzer oh, formations yeah. were basically just driven to be... De uh, repoed by the Americans and the British. Mm. Well, I've always kind of said about World War II, it's like, who won the campaign? And they will be like, uh, whoever had air superiority? And that's almost always the case. Yeah, it is. Or at least air advantage, you know? Yeah. <sighs> no, uh, air superiority in World War II was extraordinarily important. Yeah, for sure. Possibly more than any other conflict I can think of. What about Gulf War One? <laughs> well, in that one, uh, yeah, it was complete air dominance. I mean, the Iraqi Air Force was basically shot down on day one. And then after that, <laughs> it was just a turkey shoot. And, I mean, the fucking highway of death, it, it was just literally planes flying over that couldn't be touched, just striking down vehicles with impunity. Yeah. And um, that one was uh, probably the Air Force's finest hour, I guess you could say. <laughs> Although it, uh, I it was pretty, a pretty one-sided beatdown. It's kind of like a pro wrestler taking on a kindergartner. <laughs> yeah, man, it was so easy, man. It was so easy at that time. But, you know, to be fair to, I mean... The American army was made to fight the communists on the North German plain, yeah. right? So it's like, okay, well, you know, we, we have a plane situation here. And you're like, oh my god, our technology really is that good. No, but yeah, also has to do with the um, nature of the terrain, of course. Uh, we were already prepared to kill a bunch of people on flat land. And what do you know? A bunch of people have invaded a flat land. Let's go beat them. Yeah, they they want to play the game that we are the absolute masters of, that we've spent billions and maybe trillions of dollars preparing for. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, sir. You want to do one more and I'll do one more? Sure. Let me find where uh, the Driacum is on the map because I actually don't know for sure. Okay, Excellent. here it is. Well, that doesn't show it, because of course. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> so it, this is now the modern city of Calvatoni in modern northern Italy. This was a pretty quiet town in antiquity, for the most part. Not the biggest place. It was only added to the Roman realm around the time of the Second Punic War, maybe a little bit before that. So, this was a place that most people living in Rome proper had never heard of, that being Bidriacum, or Bidriacum, I guess would probably be the more correct pronunciation. 
There was a first battle there, but this one took place in spring, so we're going to mostly skip over it, but suffice it to say for now that this was a battle between the forces of Otho, who had taken over after he murdered Galba, and he fought against the forces of Vitilius, the commander of the Rhine legions. That battle had helped determine that Vitilius would become the new command, the new emperor, and that Otho would not be viable. Otho, rather than prolonging the war, committed suicide, which was an oddly noble gesture. He was trying to save Rome from a prolonged civil war. However, his gesture was largely in vain, because by the time he committed suicide, there was already another contender, Vespasian, who was the commander of the forces besieging Jerusalem and Masada. Mm. However, Vespasian was tied up in the east, and the people waging his war were his good friend Musianus, and also other people who declared for him later. Because Vespasian, while he was not at the tippy top of the aristocracy, he was a respected guy, and more importantly, he was known as someone who was not particularly vindictive, and he also was someone who was known to be a fairly nice guy. So if you work for him, he'll probably reward you. So, because Vitilius, I should mention, was kind of a loser, Vitilius was what they called a gourmand. He was basically just a fat guy who liked to eat and hang out, and he owed his position entirely <laughs> to the fact that his father had been a good general. He himself had been appointed governor and general just on the merit of his family name. He himself was completely without any virtue or ability. Um, and most of his battles had been fought entirely by subordinates. He had just been hanging out, eating and drinking the whole time. He hadn't done shit. Uh, so he, he's in Rome at this time, and he sends out one of his generals to meet the advancing Danube legions. The commander of the Vitilian forces is a man named Aulus Caecina Alienus. Um, he had been one of the commanders against, uh, for Otho, actually. Or no, against Otho, because he had defected from Otho, because he had been a Galba man. And then when Otho killed Galba, he defected to Vitilius. And when Vitilius sent more troops forward, he was one of the co-commanders at the First Battle of Bedriacum. Uh, he had done this in concert with a man named Fabius Valens. At second, Bedriacum fought on October 24th. Uh, Valens would not be present, but Kaikina would. And Kaikina, by the way, was very young. He was only a keister, so he was only about 30 years old when Galba tapped him to be a legion commander. So he's maybe 30 or 31, and now he's commanding five legions and effectively commanding the entire Vitilian army against Vespasian's forces. Now, while I said Vespasian is the commander approximately in Syria and Palestine, all of the forces engaged in this battle will be from the Danubian legions. The Danubian legions, as soon as they heard there was a civil war on, they wanted to get involved. Two of them had actually marched into Italy to try to get involved in the Otho versus Vitilius dispute. But then they decided to cast in their lot with Vespasian. And one of the leading men from this group was the commander of the 7th Legion, Marcus Antonius Primus. Primus is someone who was very politically ambitious, supposedly had a lot of gambling debts, and he was a man of questionable character. However, he was also charismatic and able, and he had quite a bit of energy. So he would take command of the pro-Vespasian forces in this battle. And this would effectively be a five-legion versus five-legion battle. And it would very much be a battle of prestige, because both the Rhine and Danube legions believed themselves to be the best that Rome had to offer. And for the most part, the consensus was that the Rhine legions were actually better. Mm. So okay. The two forces square off once again at the same small sleepy town that they had squared off at months before. So this must have been a real shock to the locals that thought that their town was a backwater. Um, this battle was hard fought. The two forces were very evenly matched. Obviously their tactics were identical. Their numbers are close to identical. And the fighting was so even that it actually went into the night. Because the battle could not be decided very easily. Ultimately, however, the forces under Primus, that is the Danubian legions for Vespasian, emerged victorious. 
And that effectively won the war. Now, the, the plan for Vespasian hmm. was that his friend Musianus, the governor of Syria, would arrive with some eastern legions, team up with the Danubian legions, and overwhelm Vitilius. But that proved basically unnecessary. By the time Musianus arrived, everything was set up. And then all he had to do was set up the civil government, which he then would basically run for the next five years. Um, hmm. As for Primus, 20 years later, he would still be a prominent citizen. He under During the time of Domitian, we know that there were a couple of poets who wrote things and dedicated them to Primus, who was presumably their patron. But for the most part, he was never really trusted by the Flavians. They thought that he was a useful guy who had helped them in the past, but that he was kind of a political liability, so they kind of kept him at arm's length. Um, but I hmm. guess that also saved him from Domitian, Domitian's uh, suspicions, so he was never put on trial, so I guess that's good for him. And, uh, yeah, it's basically the battle. Uh, the reason I haven't gone into more detail is because if you read Tacitus's histories, there is a very detailed and vivid account of the battle where you really get the feel of the battle, and you also get a very uh, vivid and deep view into the character of Marcus Antonius Primus, who's kind of like this roguish adventurer who is self-serving but also very talented and you also get a sense that he thought he was going to be rewarded with high office, but that Vespasian kept him happy enough, but left him a little depressed and deflated. Because Vespasian mm. never quite liked him. And then his sons also never fully rewarded him either. But they kept him happy enough. He never revolted or anything. So, he's kind of a tragic figure in a way. And I've always thought that, um, of all the people in the histories... I actually find Marcus Antonius Primus to be the most interesting guy in the entire book. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, you know, um, what was I going to say? <sighs> well, I guess I should get into um, my last one for the night. The December 1862... Union offensives. They will launch three of them. The reason they're doing this is because, in, in part, Abraham Lincoln wants the victory. He wants to get some land. The winter of 62 to 63 was not particularly harsh. Um, the idea also is to get a victory in right before the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, the first one will, will be the Battle of Fredericksburg. Yeah. Um, yeah, Fredericksburg's about as dysfunctional as it gets. As it gets, Burnside weeks in advance told Henry Halleck, "I'm gonna need some pontoon pontoon bridges." Not enough came in, but at any rate, the Union Army does get on the other side of the river, that being the Rappahannock River, only to find the town of Fredericksburg. I'm sorry, Fredericksburg, but the places right side Fredericksburg, like Maurice Heights, are fortified. And they're waiting to come for him. Anyway, I read part of a, bi a Beauregard biography some months before I went to college. And there's this thing in there where... I'm sorry, wait, where was I just now? You're talking about reading a book about uh, Fredericksburg right before you went to college? Right, 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 right. So there's this thing in there where Burnside, that's right, is by William Marvel. It's his Burnside biography. And he points out the fact that Burnside, one of his problems as a commander was that once things were going, he would not take control. And I found he was absolutely correct. When I read about Burnside at Petersburg, it was the same thing. Once the pieces were in motion, Burnside wouldn't take control. So for Fredericksburg... Burnside marches to the town of Fredericksburg. The pontoons are late. He crosses. The Confederates are already fortified. Okay, you're offensive as fucked. You're done. But then he says he's going to attack. And he tells Lincoln, he's like, yeah, I'm going to attack. The Confederates will never see me attacking their strongest position, which there's some truth to. Um, but, you know, the problem is the attacks are so fucking poorly done. And... Okay, so the first few Union attacks at Marie's Heights are fine as far as it goes because the attack on Marie's Heights was meant to be a diversion 
not the main attack. And it ends up being the main attack because Burnside doesn't take control of the goddamn situation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he, I guess in yeah. British terms, he lacked grip. He lacked what again? Grip on the battle. Yes, yes. Hmm. And so, like, reading about the Battle of Fredericksburg is, in some ways, particularly difficult because it really is the Union attacking over the same bit of land and getting slaughtered and over and over again, just feeding brigades in to get chewed up. The battle is a fucking fiasco. And morale, both in the Army and in the North in general, dropped quite a bit. But don't worry. There's another winter offensive happening at Vicksburg. Grant is trying to take Vicksburg. The plan was is that Sherman would land with an expeditionary force that would try to invest the city, while Grant with the main army would march to the North Mississippi countryside. Well, Sherman gets to where he's got to be. The Confederates are heavily fortified. He attacks them, and they suffer, I mean, not heavy, like, Cold Harbor-scale casualties, but heavy enough, right? Right. And then Grant, who's coming down from North Mississippi, has a stop because his supplies get burned by Earl Van Dorn, so he can't make it across. So there you go. The Union's second major offensive against Fredericksburg is a fiasco. Now, it's not like a disaster where Grant's army's inoperable or anything, but it is a significant defeat. Now, the Union, in this time period, does win a battle at Prairie Grove in Arkansas. And a fairly, I, I mean, a fairly interesting battle. Very, very bloody and intense. The only problem is, is that uh, Prairie Grove just doesn't matter that much to people. Not enough men are involved for there to be too many newspapers all that worried about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, right? Yeah, like you like like you need like a bigger battle with you you you, you know like God any of those massive battles like Shiloh and whatnot. Yeah, correspondence center stuff back. You just don't have that at Prairie Grove. The Union is victorious, but nobody cares. What they will end up caring about is Stones River, when Rosecans, Rosecrans, sorry, marches out of Nashville to go beat up Bragg, and it's a very closely fought battle. Uh, you know, famously, each side's plan was to attack the other side's right flank. The Confederates happened to synchronize their watches to attack like an hour early. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm just messing around. The Confederates attacked at six a.m. Rosecrans was going to attack at seven. Uh. Anyway, this battle is very, very close. Of course, the the Confederates batter the Union lines many times and almost break the last line. Which, if they had done, they would have cut off Rosecrans. But they don't. And Rosecrans hangs on. Famously, there was a conference between Rosecrans and his generals about whether or not to retreat. And there's two different versions. One has George Thomas saying, This army does not retreat. Or he says, There is no better place to die than here. Either way, the result is the same. George Thomas convinces Rosecrans to stay on. The Confederates, I mean, Bragg was already sending messages back to Richmond, like, I've won a great victory, and then wake up in the morning, Bragg's like, wait, they're still here? Fuck. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it looks like uh, technically the Union did suffer more losses, but they also had fewer men to start with, so at best, Bragg won a Pyrrhic victory that crippled his army. Yeah, I wouldn't even say that, man. I mean, dissension in the Confederate ranks was so intense afterwards. I mean, you know, the Confederate officers, especially in the upper crust, were complaining to each other. 
you really see the Confederacy's Western Army, the Army of Tennessee, truly break down with after this battle that is. Because, of course, there had been some tension after Kentucky, but also the Kentucky campaign had netted them a lot of supplies, and they had inflicted a lot of casualties in the Union with very few suffered by themselves, you know? Um... And Jefferson Davis came down after the Kentucky campaign to get some of the Confederate generals, you know, Polk and Bragg, to mend their wounds, which seemed to have been the case. But as soon as the Tullahoma campaign happens, the entire army of Tennessee is completely dysfunctional. You know? Yeah. So the victory at Stones River for the Union is a major victory. It gives the Emancipation Proclamation... Um, a boost because it's coming on the heels of victory. That's how it appears to people. And the Army of Tennessee is ruined after that battle. They never really recover from the Battle of Stones River. Um, so anyway, there's some of my thoughts on that battle. What you got? Well, I remember uh, visiting the site there, and it just looked oh, yeah, like we a went massive the... slugfest where they just each side had the same idea, but Bragg struck first and. They just slugged it out. Yeah, Bragg struck first. Also, the Union immediate right flank when he attacked was not properly properly ready. Like they hadn't had, they didn't have a fortified camp or any of that kind of stuff. So they barely knew that they were going to get hit up. Hmm. Yeah, Stones River. Um just a nasty affair but uh anytime you have the big bloody battle and no one wins that's basically a union victory yeah strategically for sure but i would say definitely union victory i mean the confederates had to retreat two days later and i mean there was no no way in, you know it, it's kind of weird like you read about shiloh and you have officers and men being like yeah we won the battle until the union showed up with more men right <laughs> Which is the same as not winning the battle. Yeah. True, but it, it does have the positive effect of meaning that the army's morale is still pretty high afterwards. But, you know. Um, but yeah. So anyway. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so the um, no, Battle of Stones River, very important for boosting the Lincoln administration at its at its lowest point and keeping their morale up. So I would consider it... I do think Abraham Lincoln was right when he told Grant that Stones River was a crucial victory. I think he was correct. Especially in light of the fact that the offensives against Vicksburg and Fredericksburg had completely failed. Fredericksburg most dramatically, of course. Yeah, Fredericksburg... Uh... The more I've thought about it, the more I realize just how embarrassing it was for the Union to just keep attacking Maurice's Heights and just keep pounding away while taking losses. I mean, I assume almost all the Confederate casualties suffered in the battle were in the South. Uh, mostly. That, that was actually, they suffered the most losses because part of the line had been ruptured in the Union attack there made by uh, George Meade's division. But there were losses at Marie's Heights, especially early in the battle when a contingent of the Germans had to run down, I'm sorry, not Germans, Confederates had to run down to the stone wall. And at that moment, they were exposed to Union fire. And by the time they're running down, the Union's already approaching anyway. Right? Yeah. And the guy who was in command at Marie's Heights, he was killed in the battle, or mortally wounded, uh, Cobb who was a um, Georgia politician. I think Ty Cobb's his descendant, I want to say. But anyway, he, he was killed in the battle. Hmm. So the Union was putting up some lead, but it's just not enough. You know? Yeah. Uh, so apparently, Edward Porter Alexander told Longstreet General, we cover that ground now so well that we will comb it as if with a fine-tooth comb. A chicken could not live on that field when we open on it. I've heard that line before. A chicken could not live on that field if when we open on it. 
A lot of cake, a lot of truth in that, man. That Marie's yeah. Heights thing, it's like this low slope just going upwards. The slight slope, you know? It also looks um, like uh, as soon as the Union troops left the town proper and formed up, they were pretty much right in the line of fire coming out of the mm. city. Right as they're marching up and then across the river or the canal, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, God, it was so difficult. They'd be marching through town and the Confederates are already shelling them. You know, it's a bad terrain, man. It's a bad spot to have a series of attacks at. You know? You know but once um, again, Burnside did not take control of the situation. He just kind of let it happen. In the defense really. of George McClellan, I don't think he would have done yeah. this. Uh, no. No, love or hate George McClellan, one thing is sure, he would not have done Fredericksburg. But... Abraham Lincoln, post Fredericksburg, looked at the casualties of the Army of the Potomac, looked at the Confederate casualties, and said, Huh, well, you know, if we just keep attacking them this way, we'll still be a mighty hoax and they will be shriveled. To which he added, We have yet to find the general who understands the numbers game. To which I would think, you know, like, if your men keep fighting a bunch of battles they lose, they'll just not fight for you. Yeah, they'll just mutiny and refuse to keep going forward if their generals are feeding them to the Confederates like this. I mean, most yeah, people I just, want to live I, through the war. That's one of the goals of the people out there on the battlefield is they want to be alive afterwards. <laughs> oh, man, you ever read Lincoln's, um, not congratulations, but kind of like Lincoln's condolences to the Union Army after the battle? I mean, it's just, I don't know, it, it, Abraham Lincoln was a very good president, but when I say overrated, I mean that people overstated his humanity. I'm like, yeah, he had some. He had many cruel opinions and cruel times, and one of those is Fredericksburg. His reaction to the casualties is just not very kindly, really. You know, you got him running around the secretaries being like, yeah, if we kept attacking him this way, we would still be a mighty hoax. And I'm like, war doesn't work that way, man. Eventually units break down. They go, I don't want to do this shit anymore. Yeah. You know? That's true. Uh, you can't ex ask men to... You can't go up to men and say, guys, here's the calculus of war. We're going to lose a shit ton of men, but they can't replace their losses. We can. You men are expendable. So go charge those machine gun nests. <laughs> Yeah, have a good one. I'm going to eat some McDonald's now, you know? Yeah, no, me and the other generals, we can always command new men, but we're clearly irreplaceable, so we will be sitting back at headquarters. But you, <laughs> you need to just keep assaulting. And remember, eventually we'll just draft your younger brothers or your sons, and eventually we will win. <laughs> this is just a simple matter of math and logic, men. <coughs> yeah, that math thing you said, when I read that Lincoln quote, it was actually underneath a uh, heading in a book about Lincoln called The Arithmetic of War. Yeah. You know? I'm like, yeah, war war doesn't necessarily work that way, man. Yeah, you can't like you like like you've said sarcastically with your uh spiel there. We you can't just willy nilly continually sacrifice men. They're not gonna put up with it, you know? No, of course not. Why would they um, why would they? They're humans. They're not I mean humans have a survival instinct. No man, they also have a death drive though, according to Freud. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I know also it's, uh, it's it's sort of a truism, but the other thing to keep in mind is that the only soldiers you can normally convince that charging a machine gun is not a dumb idea are usually soldiers under the age of 20. <laughs> if you talk to soldiers, say if you, you, know, you draft a, the general population, a lot of your soldiers are in their 20s, maybe even 30s, and you talk about charging a machine gun, hands are going to go up. Are you sure that's the best way? I mean, are you sure? I, I think we could try some other shit here. I'm just throwing that well, out look, there. If I'm going after a machine gun nest, I'm just going to watch that part in Predator over and over again where they blow up the uh, the fucking station full of commies, you know? You know what I'm talking about? I think so. think so? Okay, anyway. Never mind. Well, sir... This has been a fantastic conversation. It's a perfect way to end Christmas night. Yeah, we do have a couple of super. After chats. a long, long day of eating and drinking and just bullshitting, you know, how was your Christmas, sir? I was fine. I mean, uh, we were stuck here in Ohio. It's hell is frozen over here. It's cold as hell. I got a 
present from my girlfriend that I was keeping in my trunk because I have nowhere to put it in the house that she can't find it. And then uh, went out to get it, and my trunk was frozen solid. Just, I can't get into it. I get all the other doors open, but not my trunk. So I tried to warm up the car for half an hour, and still no progress. Then eventually I looked up and learned that with my type of car, you can access the trunk through the back seat. So I pulled down yeah, okay. the seat, finally got it out. Oh, one of those. Yeah, I gave her a present at about 8 p.m., so, yeah. Christmas morning. Hell, the present. Uh, yeah, okay. But the present was delivered, at least, though. It was. But I hear you. Pain yeah. Ass, man. So, yeah, anyway, that yeah. was uh, how that went. Yeah. But um, then, otherwise, I had to call a bunch of relatives because we didn't end up going home for the holidays. So, I talked to my grandma on the phone for about two hours and uh, talked to my dad, my grandpa, my mom, my sisters. So, I've basically been on the phone all day. And also saw my girlfriend's dad briefly. He dropped by to hang out for a bit. And, um, yeah, so it's been a pretty busy day. I only had about two hours to get ready for this. Mm. Now I'm glad we could do it, man. I had a bit of preparation myself. I've always been interested in winter offensives uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, my Christmas has been good. I, um, I don't know. Anyway, sorry. So, yeah, I got to hang out uh, with some friends uh, across the river and drank a bunch there and ate some food and came over here and uh, just continued the whole thing on and on. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, uh, that's been my Christmas day and, uh, yeah, quite lovely. Oh, the night before. I did a uh, cocktail tour on Christmas Eve, which those are good cocktail tours to do. They'll always buy you drinks, and they'll always tip you really well. Because they want you to have a good Christmas. People who take tours on Christmas Eve, at least as far as cocktail tours go, are good people to have a tour for. You know? Yeah, I mean, they're just looking for so an experience. So it was a nice one. And uh, probably before yeah, they have yeah. to chill out alone or hang out with their family either way. And uh, so, dude, man, they were company. The fuckers were buying me like two cocktails each bar we went to, you know. Damn. <laughs> yeah. I parted from them, came home. Most Christmas Eve, I Christmas Eve, I usually watch a Christmas movie by myself. Uh, this year, I decided to watch one I'd never seen before by Herb is Good, which was a Christmas Carol with George C. Scott, and that was really nice. And then I went to bed and woke up. And it's been a lovely day. <laughs> and I guess at this point, um, I'll see all of you uh, next year. Yeah. We're not going to do the show on Sunday, but we will pres- we'll resume normal programming uh, the Sunday after that, which will be indeed in 2021. If 2021 happens, right? <laughs> yeah, assuming it happens. uh yeah, you never know, man. We could have a freak meteorite come and hit us, right? <laughs> yeah, either that or the Mayan calendar was nine years off. Yeah. And then people Dude, just it's crazy, man. Every every few years, people go like, uh, do you know a meteorite almost hit us? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, partly it's just that people just post random shit on Facebook, but the other part is that there are a lot of meteorites in our solar system. Yeah, and part of it's also... We know if a big one hits, it's all over, of course. Yes. We got them dinosaur bones around to remind us, right? Yeah. yeah uh, we, do. we do, we do. All right, everybody. Well, we actually have I a... tell y'all good night. Thanks for tuning in while we talked about these winter offensives. We actually have a few super and... chats. What'd you say? Oh, we, we have some have super chats? Yeah. Um, oh, God. I've barely been paying though. attention. Uh, so Seth Becker donated five dollars. Thank you, Seth. He says, "Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas." Seth. Ah, Merry Christmas, Seth. Merry Christmas. All right. Um, Kaiza donated four ninety nine, and he has a picture of what looks like a pair trying to do karaoke or rap or something. So thank you, Kaiza. Cool. And he's flipping the bird too. I think yeah, it's kind of cool. Um. 
Goodman 4, have you guys heard about Mark Felton Productions? If you have, what do you think? Have you checked out Mark Felton Productions? Uh, I have watched a few of his videos. The ones that I've watched have been good, but I've only watched about three of them. I thought they were pretty good. He's he's it, it it's it's all sometimes a bit esoteric though. You know, like I think he has one video. It's like, what did Nazis sound like when they were just talking normally? Kind of stuff. You know, probably like German speakers. Uh, I mean, <laughs> well, you know, he'd have like he played clips of like Himmler or Hitler being conversational, oh. and uh, I don't know. I feel I, I uh, Mark Felton seems fine from the stuff I've seen. Um, but it also seems to be part of that whole idea of like on YouTube, if you want to get clicks, do World War II, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying we haven't tried that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Cause I mean, I find I World War II I interesting, I but do, it's... I couldn't do World War II every video. I couldn't Look, either. World War II battles are kind of boring if you ask me. The question you have to ask yourself is who controls the air? Whoever is air superiority wins. That's it. That's your recipe for understanding World War II battles. Do you have air superiority? Okay, you win. Yeah. You don't have it? Okay, it. you lose. Oh, wait, you have parity? Well, it'll be a bit of a longer campaign than you want it to be. But it's all about aircraft. Tactical aircraft, that is. Yeah, I think that's largely the case. And yeah. we have um, a couple of other questions I'll circle back to in a minute. So I was just pointing out that winter is different in different places. So obviously a winter campaign in Poland is much more of a pain in the ass than, say, a winter campaign in Italy or Greece. Oh, yeah, same thing in the Civil War. I mean, winter, of course, 63 to 64 is very quiet, except for Mississippi, where the Union does launch an offensive directed at Meridian, Meridian Mississippi, and they do that in February. Yeah, uh, why but not? I, I will have to say, though, it should be noted that winter operations, even in places where you weren't going to get a ton of snow and sleet and ice, you know, they were some... Uh, how would I say that? I don't know. Anyway, you get my drift. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last super chat is from Goodman4, $2. Thank you. Now I mm. think of that Lord Thank Farquaad you. said, guys, and then... Smiley face or laughing face emoji. Who the hell is Lord Farquaad? <laughs> um, I don't know actually. Yeah, well, of course, I don't know either. So what were I think what that calls major winner What's stuff that? that we didn't talk about just for sort of a well, I think one of the reference. interesting things about. Well, I think one of the interesting things about winter is that winter gives you an element of surprise. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing it up north, of course. I mean, so a winter offensive can be a uh, very surprising thing for your enemy. No doubt about that. Um, but it does seem to me that most of the time you don't really risk it unless you're desperate. Anyway, what do you think? Um... I don't know. I mean, personally, personally, I've realized that I have what amounts to an irrationally deep hatred of winter. I hate everything about it. <laughs> if I see snowflakes in the air, I literally can't control myself. I will say something along the lines of, God damn son of a bitch, or fuck. <laughs> or, you know, I'll just say something like that. I, I fucking hate winter. I can't deal with snow and ice. And largely it's because of my last, the last place I lived before I moved in with Tina. I had an apartment that had curbside parking, and I have a car. And a lot of times in the winter when I need to go somewhere, I'd literally have to take a shovel and dig out my car. So dig the snow out from the tires, that way I could pull off the curb and get onto the street. And it would take forever. Not to mention scraping ice off the car, and then breaking the door open, because I had to break the ice out of the hinges of the door. And it's just, it, not to mention walking through the neighborhood because it never salt the sidewalks. So it, a walk that would normally only take 15 minutes and just be a nice, refreshing walk would take 45 because I have to walk so much slower to not bust my ass. And it always pisses me Damn. off that there are people with better balance who can just walk on ice like it's not there. 
you know, I just want to clothesline those people when they get close because it pisses me off. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I just hate winter, man. I, I don't. I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy having to wear all the clothes, keep up with all the accessories. Uh, I'm laughing at the idea of you like being like, I want to beat up people who can walk on ice. <laughs> well, it does piss me off because I don't know why I can't do it, but I can't. And I usually get hot, I usually get very aggressive treads on my shoes, and I still can't do it. And then there are people who are wearing like fucking smooth bottom shoes, just gliding the fuck over it, uh, like they're Jesus walking on water or something. And it just pisses me off. I don't know why. Yeah, what are they wearing? Converse. <laughs> I don't know. And this, the thing is, though, I have a lot of winter experience. When I was a kid, we lived in Alaska for a while, so I literally have walked through snow up to my chest or chin. And to get to school, it wasn't uphill, but still. And uh, I still hate it. I don't like it. And the older I get, the more I hate it. I just don't like dealing with it, and especially as an adult, because now I have to scrape all the shit off. So it's just a bunch of work. Oh, every time it snows, that is I'm like, true. Great, I have to do a bunch of shit now. That I yeah, that's have true. To do. It's one of the crappier parts of the snow is all like scraping. That's true. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's how I feel every time it snows. So don't ask how I feel if it's snowing. I'm not okay. I'm not good. Ah well, I'm on the opposite. I love the shit, but I'm not here to rub rub that into anybody's faces, of course. Uh, Goodman four clarified with another super chat that uh, Lord Farquaad is from Shrek. Oh shit, he's right. Oh, Fuck. Okay. The moment he wrote that, I was like, yeah, he's right. It's from Shrek. Uh, Thank you very much, Goodman. For also uh, just to talk about some things I didn't talk. About. I want to list some things I decided not to include. Then maybe you can list some things you decided not to talk about, but thought about talking about. Just to wrap this up, um, one thing I thought about bringing up for this one was uh, Hannibal's Crossing of the Alps, and then the Battle of Tychinus, mm. which was basically part of that. So the battles of Trebia, Tychinus, you know, kind of came right after the crossing of the Alps. But I decided not yeah. to do that. Although those would have been good, but I figured that everybody's probably already aware of those. Um, I mean, you suggested that I do the freezing of the Rhine in 406, but I didn't know if there was any one event at that time which really sort of uh, solidified that or kind of gave a specific place to talk about. Um, I also think it would have offered a good contrast because the freezing of the Rhine is such an epoch-changing event, you know. Yeah. Much more than a measly civil war battle. And when I say measly, I mean mees measly by comparison. You know. Yeah, and I think it's also interesting that I'm pretty sure no one in the winter of 406 realized that this was going to be a an epic shifting event. People probably thought it was just kind yeah. of a. Well, the Rhine froze over. That was weird. And now there's a bunch of barbarians raiding. Hopefully the legions come back soon to deal with this bullshit. Mm, um, I see. Then, um, I'm trying to think. Because the one that eventually came to mind that I got really excited about was the Fule and Munichia one. Because that's one of my favorite topics. Um, but yeah, I realized that uh, a lot of battles aren't precisely dated by month, although if I had to guess, a lot of the naval battles of the First Punic War may have taken place in winter because that's when it's really dangerous to try to sail with top-heavy ships mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean. Then again, I mean, the Romans were pretty bad at it in general, but uh, <laughs> it would be a lot worse in the winter because the water would be rougher. But we don't. a lot of those yeah, are not rougher. dated very much, so we don't know exactly when they occurred. Mm. And arguably, I could have also talked about parts of the Sicily campaign that Athens launched, because those oh, were God. partly over winter. Although they actually took breaks in the winter. They'd go to winter quarters away from Syracuse, which was weird, uh, given the circumstances. And mm. Another one I think took place in winter, but I could be wrong. I want to say Cleon, one of Cleon's campaigns was in the winter, either the one... Uh, on Sphacteria against the Spartans or the one where he tried to attack Amphipolis when Brasidas was there. But for the most part, almost every major ancient battle you can think of took took place in June, July, or August. Some September, some October, and then a few in April or May, but mostly between June and August. 
if you had to guess the date of a battle from the from antiquity, go with one of those three months, and I would say you have about a sixty percent chance of being right. Mm. So, what were the ones that you decided that you passed on? Well, uh, what did I pass on on this one? I mean, of course, it did Trenton in the uh, winter of '62 for the Union Battle of Bulge. Naturally, uh, I decided, you know, due to time and um, all the rest, not to talk about the Battle of New Orleans when the British came to take the place. Um, there's more details to it, of course, but one thing I thought was interesting is that. Uh, one of the reasons the British lost was they doubted the winters around here. And I'm not saying New Orleans gets especially cold, but understand, it's humid here. So when it does get cold, it goes right straight through you and into your bones. And so the British Army lands before the Battle of New Orleans, and like something like a fourth their men are sick within two weeks from the cold of the, in the swamps. You know, so... I, I sometimes thought about doing a Battle of New Orleans book, but you know the, the, the actual accounts are so filled in myth, and people love their myth, so I, I got out of it. So I, I'm not going to do this one. You know? Well, um, sometimes it's kind of fun to bust up a nice myth and uh, present people with reality. W one of my favorite things to do myth-busting on, if I mean, it would be if I had more expertise in this particular topic, but there are people in North Carolina, especially in the Charlotte area, who are convinced that there was a thing called the Mecklenburg Constitution, which is effectively that the early residents of Charlotte declared independence from the crown before Congress did. Yeah, I've heard about this. And it's basically 118% false, just to give an approximate <laughs> uh, estimate on the accuracy of the claim. Wait, not 119? <laughs> well, I mean, not quite 119, but certainly 118% inaccurate. Um, but yet... It, there are, sometimes there are public festivals you might go to where people will just put up signs about it and just declare that it's true, but it isn't. Yeah, another one I thought about doing was uh, the uh, Moscow Operation Typhoon, the German offensive to take Moscow, and then the Soviet counteroffensive right afterwards. You know. Yeah. But yeah, and, and New Orleans I decided not to go with because you get a little, some, at least around here, you can get tired of talking about it. And in the case of the, um, in the case of the Soviets, uh, the, uh, the scope of the offensive is beyond my powers right now. I mean, hell, I haven't read about the Russian counteroffensive in Moscow in two months. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, sir... I think we should uh I think we should call this one an evening. Yep. So thank you everyone for showing up. Uh happy holidays, happy Kwanzaa, happy uh Merry Christmas, happy Christmas to the <laughs> British, and of course happy Saturnalia. What's the one that they say, invented? Did you say Kwanzaa? <laughs> oh, yes, um, the most important one of all, of course. Um The most important one of all. Yeah, the one that has so many celebrants. And um uh, Hanukkah, of course. What else goes on this time of year? Um, was Ramadan this time of year, or is that earlier or later? I don't even know. Uh, Ramadan's a bit earlier. Yeah, I think Ramadan's in the fall, but don't quote me on that, okay? Well, happy delayed Ramadan. And uh, what's another one? Uh, fuck, I don't know. What was that one they invented in Seinfeld where you... Uh, uh, ah, Festivus! Festivus, there we go, Festivus. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. That one too, where you admire an aluminum pole and all its utility. So, I think we covered all. I think hey, we covered all our ground. It's there. a festivus for the rest of us, man. Yeah, exactly. You had the festivus yeah. like tests of strength and stuff. Yeah, festivus was fun. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Although, I, personally, I think I kind of prefer um, Saturnalia. The idea of all the role reversal and. You know, people just kind of getting into it's really trying to think of the world through the shoes and the eyes of the other of another person. I love the idea of Saturnalia; it's pretty cool. What, so, is Saturnalia how how did that work exactly? Um, masters and slaves would switch roles for the day, among other things. Then there was a lot of drinking and um, partying and sex. 
Oh, good. Very yeah, good. I mean, Very good. Uh, there's nothing to not like about it, is what I'm saying. Now, how would you describe Christmas to uh, people then? Christmas you know? is basically an exchange of gift cards or gifts among people. It is a holiday about capitalism. And <laughs> also, you want to make sure that you give a good gift, but you don't want to break the bank. So that can be difficult, and most people in your family already own everything they need anyway. So good luck finding something great. And <laughs> also make sure to provide receipts, because most of the gift choices that you make will not be well thought out. But you also don't want to just exchange gift cards of equal value, because that's really lame. So yeah, it'll be yeah. lots of fun. It always is. Yeah, mum's the word. <laughs> you're right. A big gift exchange. You also forgot the whole family thing. It's like what you're expected to go thing? back. You gotta be back with a family in some dinner type situation. You know? Yeah, and then um, that's when all the really awkward political conversations or a lot of them that you'll have that year will take place. And you can't be mean because these are your family members. Although sometimes <laughs> your family members do not get that memo. So it's some families don't what some of the family members won't get that memo necessarily, especially the older ones, and they might yell at you or whatever. But you can't really yell back at them because they're old. So you just kind of have to take it and bear it. I think it's. I think this. You know, I got to say though, I think this interesting thing though, because there's like this uh, kind of stereotype about like you go back home to your family and they've got awkward political opinions, which. Is code for their conservatives, right? Well, that's the case in my family. I can tell you that. That's right, but I, you know, like the no, the thing, the thing I was thinking about though is that like that became like this. I don't want to say a meme necessarily, but it's like that became this like consensus amongst progressives and Democrats. And then I realized, oh, that's right. They all like left their families to go try to like go to a big city and you know, um, be like professionals. And then occasionally they have to go back to where the plebs live. Essentially. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it can be an interesting experience. But what I have noticed is that, uh, most of the really crazy shit that people say right now, it's not the older people say boomers, silent gen, the people who are saying the really insane shit are the gen Xers who live on Facebook. Yeah. Those are the ones who are really going off the deep end, at least right now. Talking about how the vaccine is bullshit and how it's dangerous and all that kind of stuff. So, if you. Well, all I can say is uh, I have four friends who work in, the hos work in hospitals as doctors and nurses, and none of them are going to take it. Why not? Uh, they, they all say it's rushed. They're like, yeah, it's rushed. Um, I'm not telling anybody else to take it or not take it, but uh, I'm just saying they say it's rushed. Um, they put more stock in the um, in the other vaccines that are still being worked on right now. Mm. And uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. My gut says that uh, it does seem rushed to me. You know. Yeah, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, at this point, I feel like most new vaccines, there aren't really too many dangers from them. It's not like the old days when there was a lot of mercury in vaccines or when... Oh, what, like that one they, gave, they, doing. they actually gave the kids polio, right? The, the first polio vaccine? Yeah, I mean, uh, and anytime you have a new invention, there are going to be some massive fuck-ups. Like when the Germans first invented uh, forestry... And then they tried to create forests that only had one type of tree in them. And then they didn't realize ah, that it was see. just going to be a recipe for diseases to spread among the trees or for fires to break out or whatever. Wait, what, what about when the Germans invented necromacy? Uh, well, I mean, that was when they had the great skeleton warrior uprising of 1878. <laughs> which, you know, little known <laughs> event. I thought about including that one since it occurred over Christmas, but it... Uh, Put down it was a very way. bloody, it was a very bloody, violent Christmas that year, you yeah, know. Yeah, but really only in Leipzig. I mean, most of the other, most of the rest of Germany was pretty <laughs> unaffected. 
the garrison was able to deal with that pretty quickly, and you know, then well, a huge deal. I raise my glass of whiskey to the garrison of Leipzig. Yeah, they uh, saved the world from the massacre of humanity and the replacement by skeleton warriors. Yeah, yeah, the glory belongs to them. Yeah. Well, everybody, uh, at least on my end, uh, good night. I'll see y'all next year. Merry Christmas. All right, Merry Christmas, everybody. Good night, and we will see you when we see you. All right. We're 